We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up. Bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Floss it like they bossing in the freak. Hey everybody, this is AEW Unrestricted. I am Aubrey Edwards with my co-host, Will Washington. And one of the things I absolutely love about this podcast is not only get, do you get to know more about you know the talent you see on screen, all the awesome wrestlers, and referees, and announcers, and all of the people that make our product great, but you get to learn more about the behind the scenes, the unrestricted, if you were, and all of the people that work to make the product what it is. Like it's it's totally a team effort. And I'm so excited that we get to highlight some of those people on this podcast, particularly today, because I feel like it's a guy that absolutely deserves his flowers for all that he's done in wrestling and all he does at AEW. So without further ado, Will, who do we have on the podcast today? AEW's executive vice president and head of global production, a man I work with pretty much on a regular basis. It's Mr. Mike Mansuri. Come on, Will. We're, we're working together day in and day out. <laughs> Buddy, we are, we are in the thick of it, man. And Aubrey, always great to see you because you're, I mean, you're, we're, we're all in the thick of this suit together. I think my favorite thing when you're talking with people who work behind the scenes is to figure out how many group texts that all of us are on. <laughs> <laughs> and by that eye roll, it's like, oh, God, it's at least three, maybe four. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You on know, any given day. <laughs> like threads on, on a given show day or even outside of show days that like thankfully for Apple and their latest iOS updates, they've made the availability to pin a lot of your conversations. And I just had to take all my AEW ones, especially the ones that get a lot of traffic and just keep them up top. I don't really like to delete a lot of stuff because it's always nice to be able to like call back and be like, oh my God, did I remember saying that or whatever the case may be. Fishing through your text threads to try to find the specific ones that you need on a show day have gotten to be very, very difficult. So thank God for the pin feature because technology is saving me on a daily here. When Will started at AEW, <laughs> I'm going to tell this story. When Will started at AEW, I asked for his phone number and he pulls out his Google phone and I'm like, oh no, you got to fix yeah, that. Happened. But I no, love this happened. phone. Yeah, I know you love this phone. <laughs> None of that green text message life happening here, pal. None of that. No, I, I had had that phone for all of like two weeks. And all it took was for Tony to reference <laughs> green bubbles once. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get an iPhone. And uh, now I'm like trapped in the world now. I just went and bought a Mac. I've had an iPad for a while. And like I was looking at Apple Watches the other day. And I'm like, man, that's how they get you. They get your their hooks in you in one device. And then all of a sudden you, you're you trapped. The dependence, man, it's real. It's, it's very, very real. Once you just get that first injection of Apple into your system, <laughs> It's only a, it's only a matter of time before it just completely consumes you and you're just pun intended all in. Yes. Well, let's talk about all things AEW, because uh, let's start with the fact that just recently, March 6th, uh, we were counting down the days to this day and to, to finally walk in and see it just felt really magical. But talking about the debut of the brand new AEW Dynamite and Collision Stage, a brand new look. We got a brand new Dynamite theme song pop. So let, let's talk about the new set design and what inspired the look and the timing of its debut. When I joined in, God, December of 22. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know, right? Like, here we are. I think we're like 14, 15 months in at this point. I used Iggy. I used an insider term, but I'm sure our fans know what eh, Iggy is. It's unrestricted. Yeah, they know what's up. That, you know, hey, you know, so I joined, I believe Winter is Coming 22 was my first show. So in Texas, right? I learned that on January, when we were kicking off the year with Dynamite in Seattle, Washington, at Old Climate Pledge, that we were going to roll out a brand new Dynamite look, a brand new Dynamite set. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, that's uh, that's great. Something to look forward to. I can't wait to see it. I didn't really know what was going on. And when we arrived in Seattle that day and I saw the set, it was cool, but it wasn't my favorite thing, just speaking honestly here. And I'll, you'll, I'll be doing that a lot today with uh, with uh, with our beloved Unrestricted Podcast, right? You have to kind of live up to the title of the of the of the show. And, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. I saw I saw the new graphics and I am not going to lie to you. And this has nothing to do with the fact that I spent the bulk of my career there. But I remember walking in to Climate Pledge that day. And when they were starting to run through elements and stuff, I looked and I was like, oh, that looks like the Survivor Series sort of look. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the, again, at this point, I'm maybe three weeks into the job at AEW. I'd been out of wrestling for a couple of years at this point, just doing MMA and work with, uh, with Pat McAfee and his group in Indianapolis. But that was the first thing that hit me was man, that, that red and blue. 
And I remember connecting with Tony at some point a couple of weeks after that show. And he's like, initially, the direction I'd kind of given the folks was he wanted to look look more like the throwback American Gladiators look. And I think that was kind of the interpretation of what kind of fell into play. You know, if you notice, as we got later into 2023, we amended it a little bit, you know, to kind of get away totally from Raw and SmackDown and the Survivor Series look. But, you know, we had known going into that summer that we were going to kind of refresh Dynamite going into 2024. Going into Dynamite 200, I believe it was. Yeah, Dynamite We went with a bit of the throwback look, right? With the color powder, you know, bursts or whatever. And I know that that was something that resonated very strongly with our fan base. Our fan base, they were very much into that sort of original vibe. And it kind of fit into a lot of we've been what we've been talking about internally when it came to sort of restoring the feeling. So I started to have preliminary conversations with Tony in terms of the new look for next year. And also we had begun talking about the set. That theme was there, that restoring the feeling. But me personally, I didn't want to do a full reversion back to what was, right? Like for me, I was of the mindset of let's pay homage to day one, but let's also show that AEW is continuing to grow, continuing to evolve. So when I got together with our internal team, both on the in arena and the post production side. And then we also involved the team from WBD as they're phenomenal collaborators to work with. Mm-hmm. You know, case in point are those what we're calling the ready to fight promos that have been airing across the WBD networks that have just been so awesome and a fresh coat of paint and a different way to kind of attack promotion for a wrestling organization. We wanted to kind of tip our cap, right? And acknowledge what brought AEW to the dance but also show you like, hey, we're also thinking about growth and moving towards the future. So that was the the idea behind it. That's why even like that colorful presentation and vibe of the new Dynamite package, it's a throwback to the color splash in terms of just that vibrance and that eye-catching, eye-grabbing sort of color palette, but it's an evolution of it, right? It's not a direct, just sort of quote-unquote ripoff of it. It's just more so like, hey, we acknowledge you. It's really great. Like I loved when the tunnels came back. Like that was such a huge thing early on to have the two entrances. And there wasn't a point where we didn't have the two entrances outside of Jacksonville just for space reasons, but making it very apparent, like this is a thing that was in my mind, one of the most memorable things of the very first stage from Dynamite episode one. But also, as you said, it's kind of that like next level, like we've got the circles in the front with the little ring lights and such that light up colors based on whoever's entrance is playing at any given time. So it's it's that next evolution that is so fantastic. And I remember walking in on March 6th and just going, oh, yeah, no, this this feels really good. Like I was so stoked and so excited. We had so much fun putting that together. Right. And again, Tony really wanted to bring the tunnels back on a couple of different fronts, right? And I've said this in a in a few different outlets. One of the wonderful qualities that Tony brings in terms of being an owner and being so hands-on with AEW is his ability to really listen to the fan base and really weed and sift through, you know, because of, let's be honest, we all have social media, right? Like there is a boatload of nonsense that's out there that's spoken. But at the same time, there are also nuggets that you kind of are like, wow, yeah, there is something to that. You know, again, going back to Dynamite 200, there was that call for, you know, hey, this was one element of the show that we really loved. And that was such a differentiator that really felt like it was so AEW. And when we were coming into designs, you know, when I was talking to our team, I said, look, in terms of the LED aesthetic or whatever, that's kind of last on priority for me. What I'd like to do is let's take the tunnels because we still had those tunnels. They were in one of our warehouses in Orlando. I was like, but. Let's beef them up. Let's figure out a way that we can take these tunnels. And again, homage to the past, but at the same time, evolution to the future. I've always been a big fan of the idea that, you know, it was something that fans really identified. It's something that fans are almost so used to when you think about the idea of our heels coming out of the left side of the screen. And the moment that somebody used to seeing coming out of the left side of the screen enters on the right, you're suddenly like, wait, something's wrong here. And you like immediately knew. And I feel like there was something to that for years with AEW fans. And it's not like that went away. Like it was still there. It's just uh, you didn't quite see it in full. And so having it back, I think I understand why fans gravitated to that so much. And the moment they saw it, they felt like it was AEW. 
Yeah, 100%. So from a production standpoint, where the paranoia set in for me, and this isn't meant to be a knock on anybody, you know, that's ever been part of AEW. But man, in the early days, right, because look, regardless of whatever color jersey I was wearing, I was always watching AEW because I'm at my core a wrestling fan. This has been in my heart part of who I am for as long as I can remember, I would remember seeing episodes of Dynamite, the camera guy would run up to catch somebody on their entrance, but they would be at the wrong tunnel. You know what I mean? (laughs) So for me... Pac is the one I I remember more than anything else, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I would just be like, guys, I don't care how we figure out, you know, in terms of the communication, we just got to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of which tunnel they're coming out of and where the camera needs to be, because... I don't want to have like an instance where we're running up, but then the camera's got like a fast whip pan over to the left or the right and be like, oh, that's who we're at. That's that's who we're getting. That's who we're getting. Well, the thing I I really want to talk about, uh, because prior to March 6th, we had one of the biggest nights in the history of All Elite Wrestling, uh, a night that I think everybody involved should be able to hang their hat on and be proud of. And that was AEW Revolution. uh, That was at the Greensboro Coliseum. It was Sting's retirement. It was Sting's final night. But overall, it was just a phenomenal show. I think it's one of the best shows we've ever put on. I want to talk about going into that show and uh, what it was like getting to put that together and Sting's retirement the the incredible video package the incredible amount you know the the amount of material we were actually still able to use for sting and everything that went on with sting's retirement and again just an incredible night that we should all be proud of i don't know how i can say it any better than that right like i think you kind of hit the nail right on the head but i mean you know look for a lot of us at aew in some way shape form or fashion this and i mean wrestling has always been such a big part you know, whether you got into it early, whether you came into it later than life, when this is done right, it fills you with a feeling. And as a storyteller, that's always one of my main goals is what sort of feeling do I want to leave the audience with when we're done with whatever work of art that w- that it is that we're creating? You know, going into this for somebody that had a massive impact on my childhood to play a part into that person's swan song, right? Because like, I'm going to be 40 in a couple of months. So, you know, for me, high school was the peak of the Monday Night Wars. You know, I mean, and even prior to that, somebody as prominent as Sting that, you know, I think my best friend and I were laughing because we were like, geez, how many Halloweens did we spend going as Crow Sting doing, you know, stupid teenager stuff, you know, on Halloween that you tend to do that isn't trick or treating. So, man, I was just filled with every sort of emotion. And to be honest with you, the night that Sting announced that Revolution was going to be the swan song, I would imagine, because I know for myself, but a lot of people started to feel a lot of pressure because this is one of those send-offs that you want to make sure is done right. And, you know, look, I was on the other side when Sting had had what everyone thought was going to be his final run in the business. We all know how that ended. We know it wasn't fulfilling. We knew it wasn't what what it should have been. You know, you can just run down everything and just know that Sting deserved more, right? And we wanted to make sure that AEW, we gave him just that. You know, going into that show, we were kind of all systems go in what we wanted to do. We, you know, we'd spend a couple of weeks prior to even, I think, on the other side of the new year, formulating what we wanted to do for the countdown to revolution and making it so so Sting-centric and pulling back the curtain a little bit and talking about his relationships that he has within the roster, within the company, and really giving the audience that full 360 perspective on what Sting meant to everyone behind the camera, in front of the camera, and in the seats, right? Because realistically, that's where it matters. You know, the feeling that that man left everyone that he interacted with, we wanted to be able to convey that and package that as best as possible to even do a modicum of justice to what he's realistically done and given himself for us. So to be able to do that and then going into the revolution pay-per-view, right? I think it was, uh, we were in Alabama for the go home, sh- the go home dynamite. Mm-hmm. The idea was floated down about what if we gave Sting one last repel? Mm-hmm. And that was something that kind of got everyone perked up. And for Sting and talking with him, it was something that he wanted to do for the fans. It was, again, it was another moment and a memory that he wanted to leave the fans with. Once we knew that that was really what he was feeling, we went 
all systems go to try to make it happen. You know what I mean? Working with our partners at the building, you know, to ensure safety, the teams that we brought in to test it and making sure that we did it to the highest safety standards possible. Tony talking with Dr. Martha Hart to get the family sign off on it and comfortability with it. You know, I think everyone on board understood what this would have meant, not just to, you know, sting the talent, but also to the fans. And to have that come together and execute it so well was unbelievable. But then the pay-per-view, you couldn't ask better. I mean, uh, Phil Ada, who oversees post-production for us in our Nashville TV studios, you know, Phil had gotten this concept of doing a career retrospective for Sting set to this track, uh, The Silence by the Manchester Orchestra. Mm -hmm. I remember getting the first cut of it and being so moved, like it legitimately brought tears in my eyes. And coming into TV in Alabama and showing as many people as I could because... Oh, when you showed me and Tony, I I couldn't hold back tears. I I was like, this is so good. This is magic. I was so excited to show that off. Like it was just, just a work of art. And shout out to, you know, Rocky Romero for getting us, getting us all that archival footage, you know, from staying in New Japan Pro Wrestling to be able to feature a bit of the, you know, the surfer thing that we all grew up and love. Jeff Jones and the team at PWI for just filtering through all their digital archives to get us the best Sting stuff. You know what I mean? It was just the perfect influx of content that we needed to really flesh that thing out. And then on top of that, Darby and his uh, his personal shooter, this guy, Max Yoder, who's Atlanta-based. Yoder's done a lot of great stuff with Sting and Darby through the years, putting together that awesome preamble to Sting's entrance, you know, at the theater in Georgia. That was just masterful. And then, you know, when you think it doesn't get any better than that, leading into the match, Thing has this concept where he wants to include his sons in the entrance. He's breaking out the gear that he wore at the Great American Bash when he beat Ric Flair for the world title. He's got the Wolfpack Sting gear that his uh, son Steven wore. I mean, ah, it was how, – how could, how could it get any better than that? You're thinking like in the build and the execution and like the goosebumps are building while we're doing the show live and it's coming together. Holy shit, this is awesome. Sorry for cursing. But – Whatever. And the match happens. And the match far and away exceeds any expectation – that anyone had like we knew it was going to cook we knew it was going to be awesome but boom mind blown at the end he just has the opportunity to soak it in the best part was that it wasn't any sort of deal where we were like all right everything's going to be whatever this is how we're going to dictate his sign off it was his you know what i mean it was all stings to have it was stings to be in the moment i mean to me i think the funniest thing in the world is that the last image that fans have of sting is going off the air for the pay-per-view is him saying they're giving me time cues <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> but it spoke to just how genuine that moment was right it wasn't anything that we tried to control we literally just turned it over to him and just let him have his moment we live in a day and age where within a matter of minutes of whatever continued on after we went off there with the pay-per-view that content was available on all of our digital and social platforms for our fans. So you got to get even more of that, but it was, it was stings. It was all stings. It was in his hands. It was his baby chef's kiss for how it went off. It was so good. I'm glad that we all got to be a part of it. I love that the direction of just let's just make it his thing and give him exactly what he wants and allow him to go out in the way that makes him ultimately the happiest And this is an awesome conversation we're having with Mike Mansuri here on AEW Unrestricted. Coming up, so much more to chat about. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Will talking to Executive Vice President and Head of Global Production, Mike Mansuri, one of the best guys behind the scenes that just makes all of our lives absolutely wonderful and amazing. And speaking of which, I mean, we've talked about your involvement on, you know, a set redesign, your involvement in Sting's retirement. But I don't think fans fully understand what <laughs> a the head of global production actually means and what you do. Now, obviously, like you're working nonstop, like you're at every show, you're on the road constantly. I don't know how you haven't had an aneurysm at this point, but I'm curious if you could describe a little bit what show day looks like for someone in your position. I mean, I've probably had 15, but I think at this point, they're all just, it's its like getting a pimple. It's just an annoying thing to deal with. <laughs> I find myself curious being, you know, what, what does a head of global production entail? No, I'm just kidding. Look, I think what's cool about here that I love and that's what lured me to AEW is the opportunity to build something, right? To have an impact on a product that 
we all believe in, but is still becoming a fully fleshed out thing. Since I joined, I oversee post-production, I oversee live production, I oversee our social and digital content. Anything basically that's content for AEW, I have my hands on in some shape, form, or you know, in, you know, fashion. But I'm also fortunate to have a phenomenal team working with me to you know really ensure that we're delivering the best content possible to our fan base, right? Because our fan base they can't get enough of AEW, and you know, it's our job to provide them with what they need. A show day. What I love about show days, and I think what I ultimately love about you know this business in general, is that no two days are ever alike. Mm-mm. For the most part. There's always going to be something new or some sort of wackiness to deal with that you just kind of have to brace yourself for and adjust on the fly and adjust accordingly to ensure, you know, that you execute to the best of everyone's capabilities. You know, typically a show day is, you know, we'll understand what the creative holds for the day, rehearse what we can. (gasps) That's right, folks. We do rehearse. I am a stickler when it comes to rehearsals, just because, again, we'd be doing our fan base, we'd be doing our talent a massive disservice if we don't walk through things. Could be stuff as simple as camera blocking for a segment, could be as simple as entrances, you name it. If there's an opportunity to make sure that we can do what we can to make sure that it is perfect, we will 100% do it. And then during the shows themselves, so I actually line produce the show, right? Which means that I'm sitting in the producer's chair and Will will get a kick out of this because Will and I have a laugh about this every time we get a look at social media. A line producer does not direct the show. I am not the one sitting in the chair calling for camera angles or everything else in between. As line producer, I'm basically navigating the entire traffic of the show, ensuring the director is executing what I want to see and what the stories are, etc. I'm producing our announced talent. You know, I'm working. I'm calling lighting cues, music cues, everything else in between to get basically the show from start to finish. I'm getting us on air and I'm taking us off air and all the fun that comes in between. It's funny, uh, speaking of directing, though, in almost 20 years of TV, I've never directed before up until I got to AEW. I started doing a couple shows here and there. I actually just directed Dynamite and Collision, actually, this past week as we kicked off a uh, Canadian jaunt in Ottawa, Canada. But I didn't start directing until I got here. And that was just out of necessity. One of our guys was just he had a family issue and then. And then he'd gotten sick. So for two weeks, he was out. And I found myself in a position having never directed anything at all, not even MMA or anything like that. Like I had never directed anything at all, sat down in a chair and called some cameras and had a good time. Thank God we have a phenomenal camera crew that can make up for their uh, their fearless leaders uh, in experience in the seat. But I had a blast doing it. Like I loved doing it. But Show days, they're wild. They're a lot of fun. They're very, very wild. But the main thing for me and that I try to instill in our group is is anybody can go out there and have a banger show, right? It's my job to make sure that we are braced and prepared for anything and everything that can go wrong. That's where you truly find out how good you actually are when you're faced with adversity or any sort of deviation from plans, et cetera. That's where you find out how good you are. Man, and honestly, uh, getting to really get a view of what you do as line producer has really just been something that I've just recently become exposed to because I just recently um, started, I guess, for lack of a better term, coaching segments and things like that. And of course, you know, being with you on the headset and, you know, going back and forth with you and getting those cues going. It's like, you know, you're really involved in what is happening on the show, but not on a level that, again, like people think it is where Mm -hmm. other than those times, like you said, you've directed. And so I I, I think it's it's really cool for people to finally get that type of explanation as to what exactly it is that Mike Mansuri brings, because honestly, it can make and does make to me, I believe, all the difference in the world in the way that the show comes off and the presentation of it all. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny, right? Like, when I came in and I was talking to Tony about things, he's like, well, he's like, you know, you know, you could like executive produce from the truck and just kind of hang back. And I was like, no, 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 man, that's not me. I got to no, 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 no. hands dirty and mixing it up with the crew. And it, it, it's, it's just my favorite thing to do. I, I get tired of hearing myself talk though. Cause you, you're basically talking nonstop on headset. I like, sound like an auctioneer for two hours straight. It's terrible. I personally don't mind hearing you, by the way. Every time I hear you, I'm like, ah, Mike, there he is. It's great. Well, I, mean, look, I, like to, I like to keep it light on headset. We like to have a good time, have a couple of jokes, you yep. know, it's a, keep it fun. <laughs> uh, I, I did want to ask you about the uh, executive vice president title. What exactly does that role entail for you? Yeah, huh? Uh, AEW's first non-wrestling EVP. I, but, you know, the funny thing, Will, is there's a funny misconception 
in terms of the EVP title as it relates to, you know, the talents that do hold that, right? I was talking about the Young Bucks, formerly Kenny Omega, after what our current EVPs and powers did to him on TV. Uh. Recently. Everyone's pretty involved in what we do. You know what I mean? Everyone is very much hands-on. Like those are not figurehead or sort of they look cool on a business title or a Twitter handle sort of deals, right? Like I know specifically from working with Nicholas and Matthew, they are much hands-on, right? Like they are very much involved in the process and they want to have, they have their fingers on the pulse of AEW. You know what I mean? Like they're not absentee landlords. They're very much a part of the deal. For me, the title just signifies it's a position of leadership. It's somebody that has an influence on what we're doing and how we're doing it. And that title doesn't come without a level of trust also from the boss. Tony's not throwing these things out willy nilly because, you know, again, they look cool on a business card or they look cool as like a LinkedIn header. When I arrived, I made it a point to tell him that, look, we're going to build a relationship that's based off of trust. It's not going to happen. I'm not expecting you to trust me from the moment I walk in the door. I'm going to earn that with you and we're going to build this relationship. And that, you know, look, a big part of my job is I have to bring his vision to life. I have to bring whatever exists in here and in here and his head and his heart onto the screen for our fan base to enjoy. And it doesn't end with him, right? There are other verticals in our company that, again, I have touch points with because production is very much a it's a central thesis for AEW. So I've got my hands on all of that. And it's my responsibility to be that conduit of all that information, to be that good partner internally, to be that good partner externally, and making sure that I'm representing AEW to the best of my abilities. I think that's a that, that's something that I don't take lightly. You know what I mean? The fact that Tony has entrusted me, that we have developed this bond and this relationship to where he knows that whatever the direction is, again, could be we want to do a sting repel in Alabama or we're going to do AEW's first stadium show at Wembley Stadium. It doesn't matter. No, t- you know, too big, too small. doesn't matter the ask. It's my job to do it to the best of my ability and to make sure that I'm working along the best group possible to ensure that we're executing what we need to execute at the level that we need to execute at. God, I love all that so much, uh, genuinely. And there's so much more we're going to get to talk about because you talked about doing a major stadium show and doing it overseas at that. And we're going to be touching on that. We're going to be touching on some big business. A lot more of that when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted, it's Aubrey, it's Will, and of course, we're talking with AEW's Executive Vice President and Head of Global Production, Mike Mansuri. Mike, you touched on All In Wembley last year. Uh, I didn't truly have an understanding when I joined AEW last year of really what an undertaking, not just doing a major stadium show was, but doing a major stadium show overseas you know we talk about being a company that's on tour and when you're on tour you know you have trucks that are uh making their way from city to city you see them outside the shows you probably passed by them on the road people take their pictures of wrestlers on the side we know the trucks but like talking about having to do that overseas i want to talk about what it was like putting that together being a part of that and making that vision come to life Woof, buddy when the idea of doing a stadium show had come up. It excited me. It made me nervous. At first, I thought Tony was joking. (laughs) I think we all were. (laughs) I legitimately thought he was joking when he said, hey, I'm thinking about a stadium show at Wembley Stadium this summer. There's a bank holiday at the end of August that I think would be perfect. And I was like, oh, okay. Okay. And sure as shit, man, he was not joking. He was ready to rock and roll with it. So I want to say in the late spring, Uh, Myself and a couple of members of our team, Mr. Greg Warner, Mr. Michael King, who are phenomenal support system on the live side, especially on the technical aspect for us. I mean, hats off to both those gentlemen. There's Mm -hmm. not much goes on can happen without those two just being a part of the the equation. And the three of us actually flew over to London and met with our partners at Live Nation, the partners at Wembley Stadium, and we did the initial walkthrough. And I remember... When we walked out onto the pitch, that's right, I use the English word for soccer field pitch. Hey. We actually walked out through the players tunnel 
which is a massive deal, right? Like this is the second iteration of Wembley Stadium, but the rich history just doesn't go away, right? So you think of the names that have walked through that hallway onto that pitch in soccer lore or football lore, it's like a who's who. You know, you're talking your David Beckhams, your Wayne Rooney's, you know, you name it. Anybody that, you know, has meant anything to the game of football has touched that hallowed ground, whether it's at the original or the new. So, you know, as we were walking through it and our person from Wembley was just kind of explaining where we were and what we were doing, to me, right off the bat, I thought, what a cool sort of little footnote it would be into the show if that were our entrance way to get out onto the pitch right? That the stars of AEW are walking out through the same tunnel that all of these just legendary names have made their way out onto the field for. So that had started kind of buzzing in my head. And then we just got out there and I'm a veteran of very many wrestling shows in stadiums, especially, right? And there, there are a few venues in this in this world that my jaw has literally hit my chest just from being completely awestruck by, right? AT&T Stadium, Dallas. I remember mass, you know, for me, the first time I walked in there and I'm a New York Giants fan, but I still walked into that building and was completely awestruck. Walking out into that pitch in Wembley and just kind of doing a 360 and taking it all in, like I was kind of blown away. And at that point, I think we were all fairly confident internally that we were going to be able to sell out Wembley. And I know that we had our detractors. I know we had our naysayers, but there was a big piece of me that felt that we were going to sell that show out. And I know that was something that Tony had shared in. So I walked out. I I asked permission first to make sure I wasn't going to get in trouble, but I had asked the Wembley folks if I could walk out to center pitch. And they were like, yeah, that's no problem at all. And I walked out to center pitch and I turned around to face the tunnel and I took a uh, landscape shot of the entrance way and I sent it to Tony. And I said, uh, I think we're going to sell this place out. I don't think we need a crazy, large, over-the-top set for our first stadium show. I want the people to be our set. Damn. And he responded with uh, a not-safe-for-work text message, but it was very, very LFG. positive. LFG? <laughs> with the LFG, right? And we kind of got ideating from there. But that was that was the initial concept was for Wembley, for the first AEW All-In, was the 80,000 fans in attendance, that was going to be our backdrop. The people that were the reason that we were there to experience that night, they were going to be the backdrop. Everything else was just going to be decoration, for lack of a better term. And man, I still think just watching that show back as as I have, because you know, I just I always like to look back and just see what we could have done better, what I could have done better, etc. Perfect. I I I Hesitate to use that word perfect, but there was still that level of pageantry, of of just spectacle and showmanship that existed. But at the end of the day, it was all about the people. It was about the people in the seats and it was about the people behind the scenes. It was about the people in the ring. You know, just even thinking about it, right? Like I got like chills just talking about it because it was just just phenomenal. And I was very, very dog tired by the end of that week. But unbelievably proud of everybody involved in kind of going through things. And I remember being in London all week while we were loading it at Wembley. I think I may be one of the only people in the company that has ever done a stadium wrestling show. And to see everyone band together and level up really, right? Because like you said it earlier, well, we were doing a show on foreign soil, so we don't have any of our toys, right? Like none of our none of our safeties, none of our comforts that we're used to from back home, none of that exists there. It's not like we were taking our 17 trucks that we tore with and putting them on a shipping freighter and sending them over. We were on foreign soil and we were using somebody else's uh, stuff. We paid for it, but we were using somebody else's stuff to put on a show at that level. For me personally, massive achievement, but I, you know, the greater satisfaction just comes from we did it. We all did it. You know what I mean? Like, and th- I don't think that's anything anyone's ever going to be able to take from any of us, right? Like, I remember talking to uh, our boy Ryan Loco in still photography. He and I were catching up at some point during the show day. I said, man, we're going to remember this day until they put us in the dirt. It was just that special of a day. 
There were so many little details about that day that I just randomly remember. And talking about this just now, I remembered a very brief conversation you and I had. But I remember watching the show and just seeing those aerial shots. And you just casually say, oh, yeah, it's the helicopter. Little things like that, like that I wouldn't even begin to fathom doing something on the scale of a stadium show that I'm sure for you is just normal, whatever, this is fine, which makes me really happy that we have people like you involved in something like this to think about all these different elements and how the cohesiveness of the picture all fits together, not only from a production standpoint, but from the vantage point of the fans. It was just so cool. I love that. I freaking love it, man. Thank you for the kind words. But like I said, right, like it's a it's a group effort, right? To have something of that scale come up and to execute it, like you need everyone firing on all cylinders and working together, right? That's the most important part. You know, no one person is really going to lead to that success. It really takes everyone coming together. But being in a in a leadership capacity, right, making sure that we're putting on the level of show that we need to do, but also scaling it in a way to where we're not putting ourselves at a disadvantage. There's a million other things that we could have done to add, right? They just would have been garnished for that stadium show. But it's being humble enough to know that you just can't get there yet. You know what I mean? Like there's still tricks that we've got in the bag that we're going to roll out for Wembley this year. Mm-hmm. You'd be foolish to try to do it all at once because realistically, you'd actually be selling your, you'd be setting yourself up for failure as opposed to setting the group up for success. But we're not done. We're not done breaking out surprises. We're not done pulling out all the fancy toys. There's still so much more to do, but it's just making sure, right? It's high tide raises all ships. You want to make sure those ships are coming up together, not very lopsided, right? Like again, we, ri- we, we rise as a team and we fail as a team. Speaking of surprises and speaking of awesome fan moments, I want to talk a little bit about big business that recently happened in Boston at the TD Garden where we had Mercedes Monet come in. She was one of the first women to main event pay-per-views and whatnot. She has this amazing background. And now she's here at AEW and she's talking about global expansion and women's wrestling at the forefront and all of these things. What was that day like in presenting that surprise like to the fans? Because I'm sure it was very different than sort of the other things that we've done. Sure. To an extent. Yeah, it definitely was. I mean, I had kind of gotten the heads up on it when things were looking pretty solid that she was going to come play on our team. She and I have known each other since not very long into her pro wrestling career. So, you know, we already had that established work in rapport and we were, you know, we had connected a few times and started putting initial concepts together of what she wanted to do, et cetera, what we wanted to do, but putting it together, honestly, was, it was so easy, Aubrey, right? And I think a lot of that just speaks to the team that we have internally, if you remember, like there was a pretty, it was a pretty steady calm backstage all day in Boston, right? Like it wasn't frantic. There wasn't like any sort of like chaos or like, oh my God, what's going to happen sort of running about. We had all, all of our ducks in a row. It was just a matter of, we were so prepared that I think the anxiety for everyone just kind of came from the fact of, let's just give it to them now. And we dotted every I, we crossed every T, we are here we just want to give it to you at this point. Cause I think again, like the anxiety was just, ah, oh, we know about this. We know it's going to happen now. We just want you to know too. Came off so well, you know, from timing perspectives, like she and I connected about, you know, moments and beats, right? Because I'm a, I'm a firm believer that moments carry so much weight in this, right. And in, in what we do, right. Because like I said, when, when this is done, right. When this is executed to its fullest potential, it just leaves you feeling, you know, and it doesn't matter what the feeling is, but it leaves you with the feeling, right? That's when storytelling is done at its absolute best. And we were figuring out what were those moments? What were those moments? Funny enough, just to bring in an antidote from the other side, and this was something I was laughing about with our director, Andrew Thomas. So when I was on the other side, there's the famous thing that internet wrestling fans scream about still to this day, AJ Styles, not seeing his name, at the Royal Rumble when he debuted in 20, well, 16, 2016. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but that was one of those things where we couldn't rehearse it in the afternoon, we wanted to keep it very much lock and key. Our director at the time didn't know it was going to happen. So in fairness to him, right, like he didn't know that it was the I am phenomenal was going to reveal to say AJ Styles. I was sitting in the truck with our director, Andrew Thomas, and we're just kind of going over notes, etc. And I was like, you know what? 
I don't know why this just stuck out in my brain, because the one thing I talked to Mercedes about was we weren't going to reveal her name on her entrance graphics until she had started rapping. Like we wanted to get the CEO chant over, which we did, and really build up the anticipation and the drama so that, you know, there's the initial pop, then there's the, yep, this is it, it's her, and then you see her, right? It's just kind of, you're building, right? You're adding layers to what you're trying to do. I sat with Andrew and we went through and I was like, all right, this is the plan of how we're going to do it. And we're going to reveal her name so that you get the, yeah. And then when she comes out, yeah. That story though, just lived so close. And I was like, all right, let's make sure we dot that I and cross that T on our end just to make sure that we cover it. Cause that was going to be a moment, right? Sure enough, it was, she came out, she took it all in. I mean, and it was all genuine. You could see it from the moment she walked out to when she got in the ring and she was just taking in all that hometown energy and the emotion was genuine. Ah, just that's the stuff that kind of gives you goosebumps, right? Like when you can see our talent and the effect that moments have on them, like you just can't help but like take a little piece of that with you when you're watching, right? And what's what's great about my job is that I'm literally watching TV while I'm doing this. So that feeling that you're conveying through our cameras, I'm receiving it. You know, I, I, I was so excited when I got the word that she was coming in and knowing that you got to be part of this, I think really helped make it special in a way that I don't even think fans realize. I appreciate it, but right? Like, like, you know, again, kind of like I talked about with, with Tony Khan and the relationship that we have, it's all built on trust and respect. March 16th was actually 15 years of being involved in this wacky business of ours. Whoa, congratulations. Wow, well, thank you. But, you know, it's it's about trust. You know what I mean? And it's about having that respect. And for me to have so many of our talent trust me enough to leave their vision in my hands, right? Because that's what I love about here. It is so collaborative across the board, talent's involvement and everywhere else. To leave that in my hands, to then go back to our team on the production side and say, what can we do? How can we elevate this? What are the little pieces that we aren't thinking of? Man, that that, that means the world to me. That's why it's a big part of why I love doing this, right? Like I missed it. I missed the collaborative end of this, you know what I mean? When I was gone, you know, when my wife and I were in Singapore and I got the call about, you know, hey, would you ever be interested in getting back into wrestling? And if so, would you want to do it with us here at AEW? Ah, I just I just missed it. And to be back in it, man, it just it fills my heart with joy. This this whole podcast has filled my heart with joy. So I'm so glad you were able to be here today. Oh, come on. You guys are <laughs> best. And I appreciate you for having me on. I'm so happy you're here today to talk with us and give a little inside scoop into some of the major moments at AEW and kind of how they came together. I'm so happy you're a part of our company, the amount of things that we're all learning from you, the amount of the amount that we have all grown because of your leadership and helping kind of build all of us up as a team. It's just something that I truly appreciate. And I know many others do, even though they don't have the platform like a podcast to literally tell you right now. But thank you so much. <laughs> I don't, don't, don't want to cry. Stop it, Aubrey. <laughs> oh, my God. No, it's it's all fine. <laughs> thank you for your time, man. This has been great. No, thank you guys, man. Any Anytime. I'm happy to do this. You know, uh, we're, we're all doing this because we love it. And how fortunate are we? that for a living, you know what I mean? We get to show up every day. That's why like the long hours don't matter. You know what I mean? When you're doing, you do, we're all doing something that we love and that we're able to make a living and provide for our families off of our passion. Like that's nuts. It's pretty damn good. I wish, I wish I could go back to like kindergarten when, you know, they're like, what do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? Everyone said like, like, I want to be a line producer for wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the chair, man. Let me, let me do what fills my heart. Like I said, I can, I can provide for my family doing something that I love. It, it doesn't get any better than that. It's the absolute best. You can watch Dynamite Wednesdays, Rampage Fridays, Collision Saturdays, ROH Thursdays. And whether or not you know it, this guy's behind the scenes on a lot of that content. So you are uh, enjoying Mike Mansuri's work. You're enjoying all of our work. All of us are behind the scenes doing fun stuff. Some of us are on, on the screen doing fun stuff. You can watch AEW. We are taking over. We are changing the feeling. We are bringing it back. We are just like, taking over. I cannot. Oh man, I'm so I'm so excited for Wembley this year. <laughs> you, you, Which, you, by the way, AEWTix.com. <laughs> AEWTix.com. Get them. Don't miss out. We've definitely got a couple tricks in store for uh, the 25th of August in Wembley Stadium. So uh, we'll see you there. We will see you there. You can listen to this podcast every Thursday, new episodes, new guests, and the video episodes on Mondays. I am Aubrey Edwards with my co-host, Will Washington. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Go!
Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted. 